Regent Davenport, you can go ahead and start. We are live. All right, thank you. Welcome back. I'm going to call this meeting to order, but I wanna share that I'm calling it to order with this gavel that was made by my dad who turned 100 years old and had a long career in higher education, um, mostly in Wisconsin, but also did a lot in Southeast Asia. So I call this meeting to order. It, the meeting of the Mission Fulfillment Committee of the University of Minnesota Board of Regents. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to those who are joining us uh, via live stream. I'd like to welcome our student representatives, Kip Roteach, I think is, is here. Uh, and I know Emily Whitcop is here. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. And as a reminder, and for our new colleagues, the Mission Committee this year has been focusing each meeting on a theme. And so today we're focusing our discussion on faculty and faculty, as you know, play a critical role in the delivery of all three parts of our mission, research and discovery, teaching and learning, outreach and public service. And I'm really excited to dive into these topics this afternoon. But before we turn to our agenda, President Gable, would you like to provide some opening remarks? And you're on mute. You're I would be, yeah, one day I'll figure Zoom out. Um, I would be delighted, Chair Davenport. I did notice that Regent McMillan had his hand up. I didn't know if he wanted to comment before we jumped in. Oh, I just wanted to see the gavel. <laughs> there. A one turner in retirement. Outstanding. You Very talked nice. about it, but we couldn't see it. Well done. <laughs> That is, that's really lovely. Uh, so, okay, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, it's an honor to recognize our university's world-class faculty and I'm delighted to see that this is the theme chosen for today. These faculty are making groundbreaking discoveries, they're teaching our students, and they're also serving our communities across the state and beyond nationally and internationally. Through the MPAC 2025 system-wide strategic plan, we're very committed to our faculty um, and we have strong engagement around goals, action item, and metrics designed to allow them to be their best selves in their work and otherwise, and also to advance their work with our students, their discovery, innovation, impact, and community and belonging. Um, across the presentations that you'll hear today, you'll see and hear important progress being made in terms of promotion and tenure and through results from our employee engagement survey. We celebrate this good work and acknowledge that even though the work is good, there is still more good work to do. And through the commitments um, captured in the strategic plan, we have our strategy and our marching orders to get there. Before I turn it over to the team to continue the presentations, I do want to take a moment to recognize the sustained work of our faculty, which is nationally renowned and has been for the entire history of this fine institution but they have been extraordinary over recent months in addressing the pandemic as scholars, as teachers, as supporters of each other, our students and our staff. And they've been tremendous and it's been an honor to work with them. So for what many of us seems like blink and a little less than a year and a half goes by or maybe blink and centuries go by as the case may be given the complexities of the day, our faculty transitioned seamlessly from in-person instruction to virtual instruction in a matter of days without missing a beat, without sacrificing quality, and while also continuing to demonstrate the depth and breadth of their expertise. Just some examples of the way in which this expertise has been acknowledged. We recognize Dr. Mike Olsterholm's contributions as a leading expert in voice for measured and accurate information about the pandemic and in helping Americans across the country safely adapt to the challenges we face and will continue to face. We recognize this year our MacArthur Genius Grant recipients, Dr. Damian Fair, Director of the Masonic Institute for the Developing Brain, and Dr. Paul Danauer of the College of Science and Engineering. We recognize law professor Michael Tonry for receiving a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship. We recognize Dr. Rachel Hardiman's vision to establish the Center for Anti-Racism Research for Health Equity in her recent naming as a Bush Fellow. We recognize Tanisha Fazal, who's just been named a Carnegie Fellow. And we recognize Ann Mastin, who was just elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And these are just examples. The risk of making lists is who you may leave out. So I will say there are many more. Our faculty have been unbelievable to watch and behold in how they've stepped up to net the moment that we have all found ourselves in as a society. 
in these and in so many other ways, we have seen them be creative and robust. And as challenging as this year has been for many, we've also seen countless acts of kindness and camaraderie extended by our faculty, which has been nothing short of inspiring. And for that and so much more, um, the university is grateful. So with that, Madam Chair, I'll turn it over to the provost. Thank you, President Gable, and for highlighting examples of points of pride. So our first um, agenda item is promotion and tenure and the continuous appointments. And this is before us for review and action. So um, it's a tradition with our May meeting that we consider the recommendations for promotion and tenure faculty and annual continuous appointments for our academic professional, professionals. Uh, Provost Croson and Dr. Rebecca Ropers, Vice Provost for Faculty and Academic Affairs, will give us an overview of the promotion tenure process and then present their recommendations. Provost Croson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Davenport and members of the committee. So I'm grateful to be joined today by Dr. Rebecca Ropers. Uh, Dr. Ropers is the Vice Provost for Faculty and Academic Affairs and professor in the Department of Organizational Leadership, Policy and Development, which she joined in 2007. Since this time, she has served as chair of her department and chair of the Faculty Consultative Committee. Dr. Roper's scholarship focuses on how educators create environments that are accessible to, nurturing of, and reliant upon people in our diverse community. Please go to the next slide. The Board of Regents policy on faculty tenure describes tenure as the keystone of academic freedom and as an essential for safeguarding the rights of free expression and for encouraging risk-taking inquiry at the frontiers of knowledge. Tenure and promotion imply selectivity and choice. They're awarded for academic and professional merit, not for seniority. The length and intensity of the review leading to the granting of tenure ensures the retention of well-qualified faculty committed to the university's mission. In this presentation, we will briefly describe the length and intensity of the tenure and promotion review process and provide some additional data on success rates across varying demographics. Under the Board of Regents policy on faculty tenure, there are two types of faculty. Regular faculty who have tenure or are eligible for tenure and term or contract faculty who are appointed annually or for several years. Term faculty are not eligible for tenure but hold professorial titles. All individuals with faculty rank must engage in scholarship, teaching, and service or public engagement, although there may be a different mix of these activities based on the faculty appointment. This presentation focuses on both types of faculty, regular and term faculty, because the review process resulting in promotion or tenure has a similar function in both cases, generating a dedicated and qualified faculty who advance our mission in significant ways. Please go to the next slide. The hiring decision is the first tenure and promotion decision. Faculty come from the best graduate programs around the country and the world where they have undergone rigorous training. The search process is national and extensive in order to ensure that only faculty with clear promise of achieving tenure are hired. Once hired, junior faculty begin the probationary period. Probationary faculty establish a program of independent scholarship. Depending on their discipline, they publish peer review articles, books, book chapters, obtain a continuous stream of external grant funding, or produce creative exhibited works and artistic performances. They must show that they have become effective teachers and advisors, and that through their efforts, they advance our mission of service and outreach. In annual reviews during the probationary period, tenured faculty in the department also discuss and vote on whether the candidate is making sufficient progress toward attaining tenure. 
if the department finds that insufficient progress is made during the probationary period, individuals are counseled about seeking other career routes or their probationary appointment is terminated. The formal tenure and promotion review process takes place during the mandatory decision year, typically during the sixth year of probationary service. Each candidate must compile a dossier of evidence demonstrating that they have met the specific criteria for tenure in their discipline. Please go to the next slide. Although we discuss tenure and promotion together, they're not the same thing. There are three professorial ranks for regular and contract faculty, but only regular faculty can have tenure. The criteria for promotion for contract faculty must look at faculty activities, but may have a different allocation of effort to research, teaching, and service, and may also consider other activities, such as those related to clinical work or extension activities. I'm now gonna turn the presentation over to Vice Provost Ropers to walk you through the promotion process in more detail. Dr. Ropers. Sorry about that. <laughs> thank you, uh, Chair Davenport, and thank you, Provost Croson. Uh, the review process begins with a candidate producing a dossier. The evidence in that dossier includes reviews of teaching, samples of scholarship, and other relevant data. Several external reviewers in the discipline from comparable institutions in the United States and increasingly from around the globe are asked to write independent review letters that become a part of the candidate's file as well. As part of the review process, faculty submit narrative statements describing their research, teaching, and service or outreach contributions. These statements help reviewers understand both the contributions themselves, as well as the context in which faculty develop their work. To communicate the impact of the pandemic on faculty work, this year some faculty chose to include information in the review process on challenges that they faced, or in some cases, new directions that they embarked on during this time. Additionally, as normal, we allowed faculty to request an extension to their probationary clocks if they had circumstances that they thought warranted that extension. And while that process is one that we have allowed for many years, what is somewhat unusual this year is the number of people who experience circumstances warranting an exception. Our process allows us to be both rigorous and responsive to unique situations that occur during a faculty member's review process. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the process for review at the department, collegiate or campus and provostial levels. For tenure system faculty, the tenured faculty in the department review candidates dossiers, including the external letters, and they vote on whether to recommend tenure and promotion. The dossier with the department vote tally is forwarded to the college or campus promotion and tenure committee and subsequently to the dean or chancellor of the college or campus for an independent review and recommendation. The dean's or chancellor's recommendation is then forwarded to the provost for a final review of the case before a recommendation is submitted to the board. And the process for promotion to professor is subject to equally rigorous standards. Just as a caveat, this is the process for the Crookston, Morris, Rochester, and Twin Cities campuses. Candidates from the Duluth campus follow a different process according to their union contract. And at Duluth, the recommendation for tenure and promotion is made by the chancellor and then sent to the provost to include with our recommendations to you. This process is also substantially similar to the review process for continuous appointments for academic professionals, the majority of whom are librarians. And there are also a few continuously appointed academic professionals in the law school clinics. Next slide, please. This slide shows the number of recommendations this year for each faculty group for tenure and promotion. 123 individuals were recommended for tenure and or promotion, and 73 term or contract faculty were recommended for promotion without the award of tenure. And one associate professor was not recommended for promotion, but instead will stay in rank. Next slide, please. 
As you know, our system-wide strategic plan includes a commitment to community and belonging for students, staff, and faculty. One way to ensure that we are honoring this commitment among faculty is to look at our promotion processes and examine any disparities that we find. If we find robust and persistent disparities, that would be a signal of bias and the in the process and one that we would need to investigate. Systematic disparities in promotion or tenure rates might also point to weaknesses in faculty development or engagement. And as you will hear in subsequent presentations today, we actively work with faculty to facilitate their development and we measure and track their engagement. Next slide, please. So this chart, this chart shows how our faculty composition has changed over the last decade to become more racially and ethnically diverse. The majority of the 6% decrease among white faculty has been counterbalanced by a 2% increase in faculty who identify as Asian or Pacific Islander, a 2% increase in faculty who identify as non-resident or international, and a 1% increase in both faculty who identify as Hispanic or whose racial or ethnic identity is unknown. The percentages of American Indian, Alaska Native, and Black faculty did not change appreci appreciably over the last decade. Next slide, please. Since 2011, the university has also seen a steady increase in the proportion of women in the composition of the faculty. Women have traditionally been underrepresented relative to men in faculty positions, especially in tenure track positions, and they generally remain so. This chart demonstrates both tenure track or tenure system faculty, as well as contract faculty. If we look simply at tenure system faculty, women are about 37% of that group. It is important as well to point out that we do not have accurate data related to gender other than in this binary way that we are presenting here. Given that people are increasingly identifying with genders other than those represented here, it will be important to more accurately represent these data in the future. Next slide, please. The metric for tenure success that is used at the University of Minnesota is determined by considering what happens to an entering cohort of untenured assistant professors seven years after they start their appointment at the university. This year, the cohorts of probationary faculty that we are considering began in 2011, 12, and 13. For each, we considered four possible outcomes. Either they received tenure and stayed at the university, received tenure and left the university, left the university without tenure, or are still at the university on the tenure track. There were 283 faculty who began their appointments in this three-year group. At seven years, 55% of them had received tenure and were still employed at the university, and 5% had received tenure but subsequently left the university. Thus, our three-year average tenure success rate is 60%. Next slide, please. This slide shows the breakdown of the tenure success rate by race and ethnicity and gender. It is slightly more detailed than the slide uh, previously included in your docket material. In particular, the first figure is disaggregated to highlight underrepresented race and ethnicity rather than all faculty of color. Individuals in the underrepresented group include people who identify as Hispanic or Latinx, American Indian or Alaska Native, Black or African-American and Hawaiian Pacific Islander. Faculty in this group are underrepresented in the sense that they are underrepresented in relation to the population of Minnesota and the United States. It is important to note the size of this cohort, even when combined over a three-year period is relatively small. For example, there were only 29 Asians represented in this cohort and 80, 86 faculty in the underrepresented groups. Next slide, please. A second dimension that we track carefully in year, is years in rank. Once promoted to associate professor, faculty are encouraged to seek promotion to full professor when they are ready. But the years in rank as associate professor varies greatly from individual to individual and between disciplines. Whereas assistant professors have a fixed probationary period of six years in most cases, Associate professors can be promoted whenever they have met their department's criteria for promotion. 
Some move very quickly to full promotion in four or five, five or six years, perhaps, while others take much longer for various reasons, including that they take on administrative roles or simply because their research takes longer to unfold. This chart looks at the rolling three-year averages of years in rank for underrepresented race ethnicity, white, and Asian tenure system faculty. Here again, low numbers in each group creates significant variability over time, and a handful of individuals with very few or very many years in rank can significantly affect the data. To better understand these data, it's also important to note that there are disciplinary differences in the number of years faculty typically spend in associate professor rank. For example, in the disciplines included in the College of Science and Engineering, the average years in rank is about six years, and CSC has a high proportion of Asian faculty. In contrast, in the disciplines included in the College of Education and Human Development, the average years in rank is about eight and a half years, and CEHD has a higher proportion of Black faculty. It is important to note that since 2012, the university has mandated that departments provide feedback to associate professors on a regular basis with respect to their readiness for promotion to full professor. This is designed to help faculty make an informed decision about when to consider initiating a promotion review. Next slide, please. This slide shows the three-year rolling average of years in rank as associate professor by gender between 2013 and 2021. While the pattern here is more regular over time, we again note that disciplines with longer average times in rank also have a larger proportion of female faculty. For example, in the disciplines included in the School of Public Health, the average year in rank, years in rank is over eight years. And 58% of the tenure system faculty there are female. In contrast, in the disciplines related, represented in the CSC, the College of Science and Engineering, the average years in rank is about six years and fewer than 20% of the faculty are female. In sum, we continue to monitor and track carefully potential disparities in our faculty promotion and tenure rates and to identify potential bias in the system and to provide developmental support to all faculty throughout their careers, which will be the primary topic of the next presentation. I'll now turn the podium back to Provost Carson. Thank you. Provost Croson. Thank you, thank you, Rebecca. So both Vice Provost Ropers and I will be happy to answer any questions about the process of promotion and tenure or the outcomes which we're tracking via the system-wide strategic plan. Chair Davenport and members of the board, I now present for your approval the following recommendations. That the regular faculty candidates listed be approved for tenure and or promotions indicated that the contract faculty candidates listed be approved for promotion to the rank indicated, and that the academic professional candidates listed receive continuous appointments and promotion as indicated. This concludes my remarks. Thank you, Provost Croson and Vice Provost Ropers and colleagues. Before we turn to a motion and vote on the recommendations, Let's open up the floor for discussion on the process or the data that's been shared with us in the presentation. Um, if you would use your raise hand feature and bear with me if I'm a little awkward on this, this first time I see um, uh, student representative Emily Whitcup. Would you like to start off questions? Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, thank you, Regent Davenport, for letting me speak. And thank you, Provost Croson and Vice Provost Ropers, for the wonderful presentation. I do want to start out by thanking you so much for addressing what was originally my uh, first question uh, and addressing that you are not currently, you don't currently have the statistics for uh, faculty that do not identify as man or woman, but are working on that. I really appreciate seeing that, and I'm so glad that you addressed that right away in your presentation. Um, another question that I had. Um, and this is going to be a little, well, a lot, so I'll uh, go through it as quick as I can. But um, so first of all, we see that 8% difference on, uh, let's see, I, I believe it is page um, nine of the presentation, page 25 of the docket, I believe. Let me double check that before I say something wrong. Um, 
sorry, that would be page 26, uh, the next page there. Um, uh, is So there is uh, that 8% currently uh, gender gap between men and women that you've got addressed there. And I'm just gonna stick with that binary for now. Um, and I uh, would like to ask how that is going to be addressed and how the faculty diversity in, compared to student diversity is going to be addressed. Um, so on page 25 and of the docket, page nine of the presentation, like I originally said, we have that 2020 faculty breakdown of the system. Um, and so we can see that breakdown, which of course, lovely to see that improvement since uh, the last time we've got that listed uh, in 2011. Um, I'd love to see what kind of plans there are to compare that faculty breakdown and try and make it match our system and our student uh, diversity breakdown. Um, and if anyone would like to find it, that's page six of the February mission docket, but um, uh, the breakdown is 68% uh, white, 11% Asian, 6% Black, 6% International, 4% Hispanic, 2% uh, American Indian, 2% Unknown, and 0.3% Hawaiian. I'd love to see and hear what kind of plans there are to address that in our, um, our system-wide system, system -wide planning, um, especially to make the 6% uh, Black student population match our 2% staff uh, and faculty uh, population and try and bring that and um, kind of fix some of those disparities. I'd love to hear what kind of plans and ideas there are for that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Student Representative Woodcup. And I know that um, it's extensively addressed in, in our um, strategic plan 2025. And uh, so Provost Croson, would you like to give some highlights in response? Thank you. Sure, thank you, Student Representative Woodcup for the great question. Uh, we have many, many, many programs designed to both uh, recruit additional, to, to enhance our recruitment of uh, faculty of color, but also to de help develop them while they are here to make sure they have the support they need in order to be successful. Um, we're gonna be talking about some of them in the next presentation. So maybe we'll hold on listing specific ones until then and we can come back to the question if you, uh, or we can follow up later if you want more information. Um, but as was mentioned in this presentation, we're especially tracking those promotion success rates to make sure that um, uh, faculty of color aren't disadvantaged in the processes that we have. Thank you, Provost Croson. We've got uh, Regents Powell, Kenyanya, and Rosha. So uh, go ahead, Regent Powell. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, and uh, Provost Croson, this is kind of continues on from the student representatives question. And it, it really has to do with, you know, for our metrics, do we, do we benchmark versus our 30, you know, that 30 university peer set or even the big 10? But in other words, do we have some larger context on these various um, um, diversity metrics? Do we have some larger context on how we stack up? And, and have we identified, you know, peer institutions that in, you know, in specific areas, you know, seem to be doing better than us so that we can, you know, so that we can go to school on that and, uh, and you know, bring some of those ideas here? That's a great question. We absolutely do. Uh, in fact, um, again, we'll talk about this a little next uh, presentation. We recently joined uh, an APLU initiative called iChange, which Vice Provost Ropers and uh, Assistant Vice President Varma, who's going to speak next, is leading, which is explicitly designed in order to increase representation among the faculty, uh, especially uh, in the STEM fields. And so, of course, we track our performance against our peers, but we also, and we learn from them, um, but we also try to engage in collaborative efforts together with them in order to, so we can all lift all of our boats. That's good, thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, um, for calling on me and appreciate the presentation. I also just have a couple of quick questions. Um, and also kind of trailing the comments of student representative uh, Woodcop and, and their comments. Um, the, my first question is, you know, Provost Corson, you, you alluded to the, the many programs we have, um, you know, that, that address our faculty diversity and we've heard about them, you know, in, in previous meetings and it sounds like we'll revisit that again. 
Um, when we look at that slide that shows us, I think it's 2011 uh, and now, and um, you know, kind of see the, um, I don't want to say lack of progress because there is, you know, in certain areas, but just um, we would have hoped to see, you know, more and better progress. H how do we then use that to evaluate those programs and, and their effectiveness? Because they're not new. Some are, right? And we're looking for new ways and implementing some, but some of these initiatives, you know, we've been trying to address for the past decades. So when we then look at the progress over a decade, how do we evaluate those programs and, and try to understand um, what, what might need to change or what is working and, and, and what needs to work differently? Um, and then okay, let me kind of get that answer and then go into my second one, Madam Chair. Pro, uh, sure, Provost Croson. Thank you, Chair Davenport. Thank you, Regent Kenyanya. So um, indeed, we, uh, this is a national problem, as you might imagine. We're doing, I think, quite well relative to our peers coming to Chair Powell's question. Um, but, uh, but it is something that we all continue to work on together and, uh, and that we're, we're interested in continuing to you know, invest in and identify what, um, you know, what, what works well and what doesn't do well. Part two, Regent Kenyanya. Yeah, uh, appreciate that, Provost Croson. Um, and perhaps, like you said, some of this belongs in the next conversation. But you know, my thought would just be that, you know, after looking into that, then then you know maybe we reallocate or shift, you know, um, some of those programs in terms of their effectiveness. But thank you for that. Um, and then I think my other one would be for Vice Provost Ropers. Um, you you kind of talked about the. Um, some of the trends in terms of the, the average, I think what average time at, at level for, for, um, for uh, say female uh, faculty or, or, um, or black faculty and so on. And, and, and there, there were those trends we saw with the specific colleges. Um, and I think you stopped short of, of uh, making a relational conclusion, but uh, I mean, are we, in saying that, are we saying that um, this this group of female faculty are spending more time at this level because they're in this college um, that that high that, that that tends to have a higher time at level, or is it the inverse in that this college has a higher um, time at level because it has uh, majority a majority of female faculty? I, I hope that makes sense, Dr. Ropers. Yes, I think I think it absolutely makes sense. Thank you for the question, Regent Kenyanya. Um, I, I think it could be interpreted to be either way, but I do think that we, if we looked historically, we would see a long uh, trend of people in certain disciplines taking a longer time to get that final promotion to full professor. And so I, I think it's it's important to be careful with these data and not um, assume that all of the difference we see is due to bias because it could simply be that people in a particular field take longer, and, I, and by that I mean all people in that particular field take longer to get that final promotion. So in offering that, those perspectives, it was a, um, an invitation to be a little bit careful as to how we interpret these data as we think about our commitments to community and belonging. Uh, anything Madam anything Chair? further? Yeah, uh, just thank you for the answer. I, I think you were intentional in stopping short <laughs> of a conclusion in your in your presentation. But I mean, I totally agree that um, you know correlation is not causation, um, you know, inherently. So, but I, I mean, I, I I would be interested in that. I, I we'll talk about this going forward. But I think that would be interesting to then kind of isolate um, the other groups, right, and understand is this uh, you know is this a discipline trend or you know is it specific to uh, that specific class, but appreciate the answer and the presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, Regent Rosha. Thank you, Chair Davenport. Um, and, and following off of Regent Kenyanya, he's uh, kind of on the same uh, wavelength that, that I'm on. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of data here. And when we start aggregating data across groups that are not necessarily homogenous, it's, you, it can lead you to conclusions. One question that um, that I always have, and I and it's over time, it's a continuing evolution. But if you go to, I, I believe it's um, page. This is the page twenty five. Um, this is the overall faculty composition by race, race, ethnicity. So, I mean, I look at this, and and, and there are obviously groups that have, and under 
virtually any analysis are there's groups that are underrepresented in these numbers. But when you look at, you know, it's, for instance, the white population um, in particular, um, what, where are we trying to, what, what's our benchmark here? Are we looking at, is it the state as a whole? Um, I would think that faculty, because of the length of time it takes to get there is probably a lagging indicator of, of uh, racial composition. Um, and, you know, 73% in, the, in this context, I think the state is, is like 80%, um, at least as of 2018, 80% white. Um, and so, I mean, what, whereas I think our student population would be, you know, more, you know, I think a bit more diverse than that, I, I could be wrong on that, but what's our benchmark? What are we trying to achieve here in this, in this aggregated data? And then Madam Chair, I have another question after that. Thank you. Uh, Provost Croson, do you want to take that one or Dr. Ropers? I'd be happy to. Thank you, Chair Davenport. Thank you, uh, Regent Rocha. Um, I'm not sure we have a, a numerical goal that we're trying to hit here. Um, I think our goal is to make sure that our institution is welcoming of talent regardless of where it comes from and that we nurture that talent in a way that enables them to be successful throughout our tenure promotion process. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you. Yeah, and, and that's and that's I think probably the answer all this time, right? We we've never actually said, and this is our mark that we're going to reach. And nor am I saying that that's the wrong number, even where we're at. That you know, because there are a lot of a lot of things at play here. Um, but it is one of those. You know, when I look at it, it's like, well, what am I looking at? What where do I see needs? And and there's some places, like I said, where you can see where you're at. Um, so some populations are clearly underrepresented under really any benchmark that you identify. The other, my, my other question, this comes a little bit off of um, Regent Kenyanya's question. And when we look at the average years in rank uh, slide, which I think is listed as number 30 here, um, you know, one of the things I've observed in my industry, um, you know, your partnership in law firms, um, we, there's, there's been a bit of a variance there between uh, men and women, in, but in part because very, very few men take time off for uh, to raise small children or you know to have uh, start families and so on. Is that at all a part of this data where people would be if they're taking some time off that they would sort of suspend and hold the, the, the rank or uh, I mean I, just trying to understand what the difference is much like my, my colleague was trying to do. Provost Croson. Thank you, uh, Chair Davenport. Thank you, Regent Rocha. Um, so there is some data on childbearing. I would say it's pretty far in child care, I would say it's pretty far from conclusive. So I would hesitate to, to rely on that. Um, we do see that within academia, women are more likely to take on administrative duties or those kinds of leadership roles, interestingly, than men are. Um, and so that's sometimes pointed to as a, uh, as a hindrance to the timely promotion. But of course, every case is different. I mean, there's a lot of individuality at this stage in one's career. And so I wouldn't want to uh, sort of point to a, a general cause. Thank you. And Madam Chair, just a final comment, if I can. Um, yeah, it, it, this is, I, I think this stuff is really important and it's always fascinating, right? To look at how, and just over time, it's changed so, so dramatically. Um, I, just, I know that when you break it down to the college level, it, it can be so dramatically different where in some cases, this group is way overrepresented and other, they're almost not represented at all. And, and, and so uh, I, I appreciate the work that we're doing on this and hope we can continue to have a, a good dialogue about how to make sure people are having uh, every opportunity regardless of what their, their personal demographics are. Thank you. Yes, indeed, it's complex and tenure does um, represent a tremendous amount of work um, by the faculty and those that uh, step up to do the reviews. So I don't see any more hands. So let's um, turn to the recommendations. Is there a motion to approve the promotion of tenure um, and our tenure of regular faculty, the promotion and rank of contract faculty and the continuous appointment and promotion of the academic professional candidates as presented? I'll make that Second. motion. Second. I'll second it. Great, thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any more discussion on the motion? I see no further discussion. Ms. Flatten, will you take the roll, please? On the motion to recommend approval of promotion tenure and the annual continuous appointments, Regent Farnsworth. Yes. 
Regent Farnsworth votes yes. Regent Herr is absent. Regent Hipsch. Yes. Regent Hipsch votes yes. Regent Johnson. Yes. Regent Johnson votes yes. Regent Kenyanya. Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Mayron. Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent McMillan. Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Powell. Yes. Regent Powell votes yes. Regent Rosha. Yes. Regent Rosha votes yes. Regent Swigum. Yes. Regent Swigum votes yes. Regent Verhalen. Yes. Regent Verhalen votes yes. Chair Davenport. Yes. Chair Davenport votes yes. Madam Chair, there are 11 yes votes, zero no's, and one absent. Uh, by unanimous uh, votes, the motion passes. So congratulations to all the faculty and academic professionals receiving tenure, promotion, or continuous appointment today. Your hard work and dedication has not gone unrecognized. This is a tremendous achievement. Best wishes to you on your continued academic success. We will now move to the second agenda item on faculty development. And our, our uh, presenters, uh, again, thank you, Vice Provost Ropers. And uh, Dr. Ropers will be joined by Associate Vice Provost for Equity and Diversity, Dr. Keisha Varma, for this discussion. And uh, before I turn it over to our presenters, do you have any opening comments, Provost Croson? Thank you, Chair Davenport and members of the committee. Our second topic for today's meeting is pivotal to all areas of the university's success. I know you all have an appreciation shaped by your eclectic mix of experiences of how important it is for great organizations to develop their talent. At universities, our faculty are our greatest asset. And perhaps unsurprisingly, we spend significant time and energy developing our faculty after we have successfully recruited them. To describe some of our faculty development initiatives, I'm thankful to have Dr. Rebecca Ropers and Dr. Keisha Varma to lead this presentation. You heard me introduce Vice Provost Ropers a moment ago. Dr. Varma is Associate Vice Provost in the Office of Equity and Diversity and Associate Professor in the Department of Educational Psychology. Dr. Varma's research explores the cognitive processes that underlie science learning. Her work intersects educational psychology, cognitive science, and the learning sciences to examine learning and cognition in technology-enhanced classroom settings. Chair Davenport, with your permission, I'd like to ask Vice Provost Ropers to begin. Thank you. Go ahead, uh, Vice Provost Ropers. Uh, let's see, are you muted? <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> ah, Chair Davenport and members of the board, I'm so pleased to be here with you and with Associate Vice Provost Keisha Varma to talk about the faculty development efforts at the University of Minnesota. This conversation flows very nicely from the previous one in that it is a part of our commitment to support all of our faculty and make sure that they are well poised to serve our students and conduct really groundbreaking research. As Provost Croson mentioned, we come to this presentation as faculty members who also hold administrative roles that are intended to support faculty. So both Associate Vice Provost Keisha Varma and I hold both of those positions and they both inform our perspectives. In today's presentation, we will discuss how faculty development happens through both central collegiate or campus-based efforts and through individual faculty initiative. As you know, we hire truly outstanding faculty who are lifelong learners committed to teaching, researching, and serving in ways that make a difference in our world. And the university tries to help them do exactly that. Most of what you will hear today relates to the strategic plan commitments focused on student success, discovery, innovation, and impact, and community and belonging. We will also talk briefly about our efforts to promote leadership development in faculty who assume leadership roles at the university. 
Next slide, please. Some elements of the strategic plan are about faculty explicitly, but for most elements, we rely on faculty in order to enact behaviors that will drive change. For example, it's through faculty effort that we will enhance the quality of our educational offerings and elevate our profile and standing. In this presentation, we will discuss some of the resources and support that we provide to our faculty to enable them to de deliver on these important initiatives. While we offer many such resources to the university's more than 4,000 faculty, today we will highlight only a few. Additional information is listed in your docket, and there are many, many more resources that we also did not have the space to list. As we consider faculty development, we want to underscore a few points. First, we promote development with the hope that both individuals and our larger community will benefit. I often thank people who participate in faculty development offerings by saying, thank you for your investment in yourself and in the university, because individual and collective quality are mutually constitutive. Second, to be successful in achieving equity among our faculty, we need to offer robust and inclusive faculty development opportunities that meet the needs of all of our faculty. While some of our development efforts focus specifically on diversity or the needs of a particular group, all of them should help to facilitate equity and success among all of our faculty. As Lynn Pascarella, president of the Association of American Colleges and Universities recently said, equity and quality are interconnected and interdependent values. They are both necessary ingredients for inclusive excellence. And then third, helping faculty develop may lead them to, be, to become more engaged and more satisfied. The satisfaction may lead to greater retention as well, which aligns with strategic plan goals associated with community and belonging. Next slide, please. So either directly or indirectly, faculty development efforts exist to advance most of the strategic plan indicators associated with student success. Today, we'll share information just about some of our central resources that are accessed by faculty throughout the system. And then we'll also talk about a few that are initiated by colleges or groups of colleges or by faculty themselves. The Center for Educational Innovation is a system-wide unit whose mission is to advance effective teaching and engage learning. From March of 2020 to today, CEI has interacted with instructors nearly 9,000 times in one-on-one -on -one consultations with faculty and academic leaders, workshops, webinars, or other online resources, classroom visits, and student feedback facilitations. Each college and campus also has an, at least one CEI liaison that faculty and leaders in that unit can contact for individual or campus or college-wide consultation. During the last year, the three areas that faculty most sought CEI support for were online, remote, or blended teaching, diversity, equity, and inclusion, or course design. CEI also partners with other units such as GPS Alliance, the Libraries, Disability Resource Center, Academic Technology Support Services, and many others to provide support for teaching and curricular innovations. Both in collaboration and independently, the resources these other units provide are also significant for faculty development. For example, ATSS, Academic Technology Support Services, has supported more than 1,000 individual faculty members in effectively integrating technology into teaching over the last year. And CEI's partnership with GPS Alliance has yielded two programs which help instructors internationalize their curriculum. Courses enriched through these programs have served more than 25,000 students. Another central resource that is widely subscribed is the Office for Equity and Diversity's Equity Certificate Hosted Online, or ECHO program. Building on a successful program that has been hosted in person for many years, ECHO strengthens faculty members' ability to work and communicate across difference. Additionally, OED's education department offers specific workshops on facilitating conversations in the classroom and identifying implicit bias. Since July of 2018, OED's education program has provided more than 200 departmental level certificate training sessions to an estimated 6,500 participants. Offerings include approximately 130 sessions a year with approximately 30% of those participants being faculty. 
Each of the sessions has a wait list, the size of which has increased since the transition from in-person to online sessions. We also have many faculty development resources offered by individual colleges or campuses. One involves a major effort by this, the College of Liberal Arts on the Twin Cities campus to strengthen career readiness and outcomes for our students. As part of that initiative, CLA developed the Career Readiness Teaching Fellows Program to support faculty and instructors in discovering creative approaches to activities and assignments that enhance student reflective learning and prepare them for careers. This action advances the strategic plan initiative related to strengthening career readiness and outcomes. Thus far, 100 faculty have completed the program and they're better equipped to develop teaching strategies that help students develop, understand, and articulate the 10 core career competencies that are inherent in a liberal arts education. And finally, I think it's important to point out that faculty are largely in charge of determining what they need to develop in their own careers. With a few exceptions, they get to choose how to invest their time and how to learn. An example of faculty leading their own development is the Academy of Distinguished Teachers. This is a group composed of approximately 300 faculty from across the system who have won university-wide teaching awards. In the past, they've hosted brown bag conversations, workshops, conference, a weekend retreat, all to discuss issues about how to be effective teachers. Last summer and fall, given the need to shift to virtual interactions, they initiated a teaching topics happy hour to discuss topics like academic integrity, student isolation, and creating a supportive online environment in turbulent times. I'll now turn it over to Associate Vice Provost Varma to discuss some of our faculty development initiatives that advance discovery, innovation, and impact. And next slide, please. Thank you, Dr. Ropers and Vice Provost Varma. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Davenport, and thank you, Vice Provost Ropers. I will begin by discussing the ways our university provides faculty development to advance discovery, innovation, and impact. One of the ways we do this is by supporting faculty to engage in research, scholarly, and artistic activities that increase their academic success and elevate their national and international profiles. There are many ways in which the university provides research training, funding, and consultation. Grant and aid is an example of a central initiative for research funding. It is a long-standing initiative sponsored by the Office of the Vice President for Research that provides research funding opportunities that are open to all tenure track faculty. Projects funded by grant and aid are often collaborative, interdisciplinary efforts that include graduate students and grant and aid funds approximately 100 faculty each year. Another central initiative mentioned in the second bullet on this slide is the university's institutional membership in the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity, or NCFDD. Faculty at all stages can take advantage of this membership. NCFDD provides resources and webinars to help faculty increase their research and writing productivity while also maintaining a healthy work-life balance. For the past two years, our university has hosted an NCFDD workshop on building a publishing pipeline. These workshops were system-wide and included faculty who were assistant, associate, or full professors, and it also included um, postdocs and graduate students. Over 200 participants engaged in this year's virtual workshop. The Faculty Success Program is a popular NCFDD resource as well. It is a 12-week online program where faculty are paired with mentors and participate in multiple professional development meetings to help them address the challenges associated with navigating the institution and the promotion and tenure process. The Office for Public Engagement also leads multiple central initiatives that advance the university's mission and commitment to the public good by supporting faculty throughout the five campus system to develop their capacity for publicly engaged research, teaching, and outreach. They offer mentorship programs, professional development opportunities, one-on-one -on -one consultations, conferences, and grant programs. The Office for Public Engagement has helped our university to support, elevate, and value publicly engaged, community-based scholarship. 
As stated earlier, it's also important to point out that colleges and campuses often have resources and events to support faculty development. Race, Indigeneity, and Sexuality Studies, or RIGS, in the College of Liberal Arts is a leader in this space. They host multiple events focusing on issues of interest to a broad range of scholars. CTSI is a leader in providing mentorship and support for grant writing. They have a particular focus on meeting the needs of early career faculty members as they build their research careers. CTSI partners with eight colleges on the Twin Cities campus, UMN Duluth, Hennepin Health, and the Minneapolis VA. Next slide, please. On this slide, I transition to talking about how we provide faculty development to advance community and belonging. We recognize that faculty members' ability to teach, conduct research, and serve will be enhanced if they feel a sense of belonging in a community that values and encourages their contributions. Developing a successful culture that embraces diversity requires recruiting faculty into a vibrant and highly interactive community of, of scholars. Professional development alone is insufficient to foster a thriving community of inclusive excellence. We must also create environments that accelerate success through institutional change and the provision of the right skills at the right time within the right supportive context for each individual in the system, including those from majority groups who form the dominant culture of the institution. When faculty join the University of Minnesota community, they are invited to participate in the new faculty orientation and new faculty program noted in the first bullet of this slide. The orientation and ongoing programming introduces them to resources throughout the university and helps them to determine when and where they want to seek support and engagement. NIH First is an effort to increase our community of diverse faculty scholars. We are hoping to recruit a cohort of 10 underrepresented minority faculty studying the basic behavioral and computational neurosciences to the university via the NIH Faculty Institutional Recruitment for Sustainable Transformation or FIRST program an interdisciplinary team of faculty and academic leaders from the medical school, CLA, CEHD, and OED recently submitted a proposal to this program. By building on successful programming from CTSI, mentoring experiences will be provided and designed, designed and provided to meet the core psychological needs that are necessary for faculty motivation and well-being, while education experience for experiences for department chairs and current faculty will focus on creating a welcoming and inclusive environment for the newly hired faculty. As we consider the broad range of support necessary for faculty development, we know that unethical behavior in any form compromises research, teaching, and outreach. It impedes our university's ability to recruit and retain faculty and also takes time and energy away from doing our core work. In order to ensure that we have a respect for culture, culture that advances our commitment to excellence in research and teaching, we have asked all employees throughout the university to participate in an online education module, which is intended to promote a healthy climate, campus climate that is free from sexual misconduct, discrimination, and retaliation. Further faculty development that advances community and belonging is supported by equity-oriented groups that provide opportunities for faculty to learn and grow their own capacity related to equity and diversity. Two of these are the Diversity Community of Practice and the Climate Support Network. We also want faculty to help students experience a sense of belonging. Critical development efforts that strengthen both faculty and student belonging are provided by the Disability Resource Center. The DRC offers consultations with both individual instructors and academic departments about implementing reasonable accommodations, discussing ways to explore inclusive teaching and learning strategies, and exploring ways to reduce course stress. Throughout all these efforts, the DRC helps instructors understand disability as a marginalized identity and to understand that access is an equity issue. 
I'll close this section of the presentation by recognizing that there are many faculty development programs and initiatives throughout the university. Through our membership in the NSF funded iChange program, the university is presently undergoing a self-assessment process that will provide valuable information about the programs and initiatives being offered at the university, college, and unit level to support faculty development, retain diverse faculty, and increase job satisfaction. That's the end of my presentation. I'll turn things back over to Vice Provost Ropers. Thank you, Dr. Barma and Vice Provost Ropers, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, in addition to developing their capacities as teachers and researchers, the university helps faculty develop as the future leaders of this institution. While faculty can be leaders in multiple ways to include by partnering with President Gable, Provost Croson, and all of you through the board through shared governance. One of the key ways in which they can lead is through positions such as department chair or head, associate deans, deans, center directors, and other such positions. Faculty in Academic Affairs, the Office of, uh, or the Office for Human Resources and the Office of uh, Equity and Diversity work collaboratively and with other units to provide that leadership development. In your docket is a summary of some of those leadership development opportunities that faculty can participate in throughout the career. Right now, I'm just going to highlight a, a few of them quickly. We host a Provost Academic Leadership Seminar, which we call PALS a year long program for new chairs, heads and associate deans for faculty affairs that introduces them to their roles and responsibilities at the university. And in addition to the many informal opportunities to connect with each other and learn from each other, we are launching a new program for advanced chairs and heads in their second to fifth years in the fall of 2021. So we can continue that development opportunity. We also partner with the Big Ten Academic Alliance to offer in-depth leadership development for both department executive officers and for six mid-level faculty leaders each year from each of our institutions. In this program, participants uh, increase their understandings of universities as dynamic and inclusive institutions and learn various approaches to leading in this diverse, complex, and changing higher education landscape. Alums of this program often assume roles with greater responsibility upon completion. In fact, many of our current associate deans, nearly half of our current academic deans, Vice President Chris Kramer, Vice Provost Bob McMaster, and the two of us have been participants. Next slide, please. So faculty development is critical for the present and the future of the University of Minnesota. We hire faculty who are deeply invested and we support them in deepening that investment in their own work and in student success. What we presented today was just a snapshot of the opportunities for faculty to, to develop their capacity to advance their own work and the work of the university. We look forward to your questions and discussion and would especially benefit from your thinking around the questions here. What development strategies or principles have you seen successfully enacted in other organizations that might strengthen our faculty development offerings? And then in particular, what strategies might advance our commitment to inclusive excellence? Thank you for your time and your investment in the development of our faculty. Thank you presenters, that was a, a, an excellent presentation. Um, as you were talking, I was thinking about how you're really creating an ecosystem that first enables uh, faculty success, which then in turn enables student success, which really ultimately de delivers on our mission. So uh, thank you. I'm even going back to our HR discussion today and as we think about the future, it all knits together nicely. Um, let's have some discussion. You notice that we, put up some discussion questions. Uh, many of you have been participating in AGB and other types of uh, conferences, campus visits, and I know our new uh, regents are looking forward to visiting campuses firsthand. But if you um, take a look at those questions um, and think about um, what you've seen, um, any comments you have or questions for our presenters. And uh, if you use raise hand, again, I'll try to follow that to the best I can. And Madam see, Chair, Regent McMillan has his hand raised. Oh, thank you. Uh, Regent McMillan, please. 
Thank you, Chair Davenport, and uh, thanks for this dialogue and the materials and and creating time on our governance agenda for for this topic. I, this may sound like an overstatement. I don't think it is. It's uh, I just can't imagine a more important place for this university to invest its resources than in developing leadership, interest, and talent from within our own ranks on the academic side of, of the house. And one of the great mysteries to me has been over a decade of service here is what would prompt someone to devote a good chunk of their academic commitment to leading other academic talent, i.e. the department head role, because it often looks from this layperson's perspective to be hard and sometimes thankless work. Um, so I'm not asking how you get people to do that, but identifying the talent and investing the time and effort needed and finding the money needed to make that 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 talent commitment real is just so so critically important. So bravo for that. And uh, I hope that we put our money where we need to when you ask us to support this kind of leadership development work. It's just it's just I cannot understate overstate how important it is in any organization and, and us getting to it here. And I know we've been doing it, but uh, really starting to double down on it seems like an investment for the future. So that's a comment. Now here's a question within the ranks or within that work that you're doing in those, I don't know if you call them institutes or what, but um, in, in developing department head level talent, how do you connect people with HR skill sets and HR protocol and HR best practices? Because of all the things that a leader needs to learn, obviously, you know, People are led, things are managed. So learning to lead is super important, but leading other people is the hardest thing anybody ever does in a leadership role. And so much of that is infused with what the HR world. And I just don't think most faculty go to school to learn about HR practices and things. So can you give me any examples of how you work that into that system and into that kind of leadership development? Uh, good question. Uh, Provost Croson, do you want to take that? So I'm, I'm actually going to point to Dr. Ropers, who's uh, been very involved in collaborating with HR to make sure that our department chairs have the, the leadership tools they need. So, Rebecca? So, Chair Davenport, Regent McMillan, thank you so, so much for that question. Um, some of your earlier comments about the importance of the department executive officer's role, which is a more generic term for the people who lead our departments, um, some of the things that came to mind in your initial comments also relate to the, the question that you're asking about how do we get people to have the skills and uh, disposition, I think, too, and knowledge about how to effectively lead these organizations. I think over time, what we've come to understand, in, both in the University of Minnesota, but also more broadly, is that um, being an academic does not necessarily mean you know how to lead other academics. And so there is a, a concept called academic HR. Um, because likewise, on the other side, being an HR professional does not mean that you know how to lead academics either. Right. So right. We're, needing to we're needing to combine that knowledge. And I will just say that um, in the last couple of years, we are moving in that direction in really significant ways. It was just a phrase in the presentation, but, but there's a lot behind it that OHR and our office, um, the Provost Office, Faculty and Academic Affairs, and increasingly OED as well, are joining hands to make sure that the academic knowledge and ways of being, any knowledge we can glean from HR as experts, as well as the, the literature and what we know from that area, um, as well as what we need to do to, to move towards our goals of being an inclusive institution. We're working much better, much more closely hand in hand. Some of that can be seen in the, um, the information we provided in the docket uh, with some sort of specific kinds of things that people can take advantage of uh, with leadership development, but there, there's a lot more than what you see on that one sheet as well. So I really appreciate the question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Was there anything else? Uh, Regent McMillan, follow up? No. Nope. It, 
it is, a, I might add, um, a risk to go into administration from faculty, um, <laughs> skills or no skills. It's yeah. just a little different world. Uh, Regent Powell. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Davenport, and thank you um, to the two, to the presenters, um, Vice Provost Ropers and Varma. Terrific presentation. It's very impressive, you know, how much thought and work, you know, has gone into this topic. And I, I really enjoyed hearing what you've done. And I'm, I'm sort of thinking about, um, you know, things that I've seen that I, that I think were successful. And, and I thought I, I thought I'd give you um, or offer a couple of ideas and one has to do with i mean i think if you go into the private sector there's a lot of a lot of thought has gone and, and research has has gone into developing you know a theory of development theory may be you know too strong a word here or too big a word maybe it's just some ideas but there's been a lot of research a lot of interviews and discussions with successful individuals you know asking them to reflect on you know what were your strongest developmental experience or experiences if you think back over your career what really what really you know accelerated made you a better person a better professional and i think invariably you know what you learn or what you hear often in that kind of when you you know do that systematically with our conversations is you know anything that required you to make the biggest change you had to learn the fastest we got into a situation where you recognize some strengths that you had, but also some things that you were no good at, you know, and all of that happened fast. Those kinds of experiences that really stretch you are, you know, are really crucial. And so I'm, I would be curious to, you know, know if, if that, you know, an opportunity to maybe dig more systematically about that in this space, which is a different professional space from, you know, from in, in many ways from private business. So, but it's, I, it's been done very successfully. And I think it's led to a lot of good, if you will, HR ideas in the private sector on how to develop people. And the other, the other you know, thought I'll offer, and this is really just a tool, but um, at, you know, that point in everyone's career, if you have, can have someone sit down with you and help you develop your own personal development plan, where someone really kind of goes through a set of questions, where do you want to go? You know, and it may be that you want to go very, very deep in your field, or you want to be, you know, really the best teacher, or you want to run the department, or you want to run the university. But, you know, at that point where, where you really do get to crystallize your thoughts on wh what you want to do and what it's going to take to get there and you sort of develop a plan. So I think that is a very, that sort of individualized um, development plan is a very powerful tool, and I don't know if we have it. Maybe, maybe we do. But um, that, so those are a couple thoughts for you. You know, no need to respond, but um, you ask for successful strategies, and there are a couple. Thank you, Regent Powell, and I think uh, mentorship is built into that as well in both the private and public sectors. Any other comments in response? Then. Uh, I'll just I'll just chime in um, to Davenport and, and Regent Powell. Thank you. I think your those suggestions are fantastic, and we we do a lot of them. But it's worth thinking about more as well. Um, I think there's a really interesting shift around uh, sort of from mentorship to sponsorship, which we're exploring as well. Which I think is going to be an important kind of conceptual move. Um, I also think one of the things that makes the University of Minnesota system so unique is the strength of its faculty governance. And those faculty governance structures provide opportunities, as you've described, for faculty to stretch into new situations that they're maybe less familiar with. And so I think we need to continue to leverage and invest in our faculty governance structure, both because it's good in and of itself, but also because it provides an important um, development opportunity. I think that's great, Rachel. And it, you know, the overused expression, but you know, this idea of getting into roles that really do take you out of your comfort zone. I mean, there's a lot of truth there. Those, those, that's where you develop. Right. We've got uh, Regent Hitch and then Regent Mara. Um, thanks, Thank uh, Chair Davenport, uh, and great presentation from. Um, Provost Grossen and Vice uh, Provost Varma, I loved it, especially uh, page 44 of your slides. 
That's that's one of those I can really wrap my head on. And it talks about the three commitments that we have in our MPAC 2025. And I guess the question I have specifically about that is, um, how are we prioritizing our societal needs and workforce needs when we basically need everything? And we are a really big state and we have tens of thousands of job openings everywhere. And I guess that's, how do we prioritize? Uh, there's just so many needs right now. So that's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Provost Carlson. Yeah, great question. Thank you, uh, Chair Davenport, Regent Hatch. So, um, so the answer is, of course, we try to do as much as we can. Um, and we're also guided by faculty and student passion and interest. And so part of it is to ensure that we have the faculty and the students in place who are, who are passionate about those topics and that we support them uh, in whatever they need in order to achieve those goals. Thank you. Anything further? Uh, Regent Mayron. Well, I think that the, my, my comments are being picked up by the earlier, my colleagues in their earlier comments, but I'm thinking back on my experience in private practice and at least in the field that I was in over and over again, what we heard was probably the biggest game changer is when individuals had mentors uh, and coaches to assist them. And those who did not never seemed to succeed as well as those who did. So again, to the extent that we're providing uh, and encouraging faculty to member, mentor other faculty, but also to train faculty and leaders how to be mentors, I think um, is a component that leads to success among all faculty. Thank you, Regent Mayron. I'm not seeing other hands and I'm thinking that let's move right into our third item because these blend so well together. And that is on uh, employee engagement, uh, faculty employee engagement. And we have with us, um, we're joined by Professor Phil Buhlman, whom most of you know, Chair of the Faculty Consultative Committee, and Dr. Brandon Sullivan, Senior Director of Leadership and Talent Development, and Interim Senior Director of Employee Relations from our own HR office. Uh, and again, we're, we're building on this theme of faculty, and I think these all just really work well together. So, um, Provost Croson, do you have any opening comments? Uh, thank you, Chair Davenport and members of the committee. As with the previous presentation, I don't need to tell this group how important it is for members of any successful organization to feel that they belong, to share a commitment to mission and to excellence, and to feel valued and respected. Engaged employees, and in today's context, engaged faculty, are pivotal to the success of our university and are identified as a specific deliverable in the university's system-wide strategic plan. But measuring engagement can be nebulous and difficult. I'm proud that the university is ahead of most of our peers in our ability to monitor and set goals related to employee engagement. Today, we'll be talking specifically about faculty engagement. So I've asked both HR and faculty governance leaders to guide our discussion. Many of you know Dr. Phil Bowman as chair of the university's faculty consultative committee. He is the 3M alumni professor in the department of chemistry and a distinguished university teaching professor. His scholarship and that of his team explores the use of molecular recognition for chemical sensing and develops chemical sensors for clinical and environmental applications. Dr. Brandon Sullivan is Senior Director of Leadership and Talent Development and Interim Senior Director of Employee Relations in the Office of Human Relations. Dr. Sullivan is also one of our faculty, serving as a senior lecturer in the Carlson School of Management and the Center for Spirituality and Healing where he teaches graduate courses on leadership, organizational behavior, and well being in the workplace. Dr. Sullivan received his PhD from the University in Psychology in 2006. 
And with that, I will turn it over to our presenters. Thank you. Go ahead, Professor Buhlman and Dr. Selbin. Chair Davenport, uh, members of the committee. Um, I'm very happy to be here today to discuss faculty engagement. These are clearly challenging, but also transformative times for our world and for our university. And continuing to support faculty engagement will be an important part of how we navigate current challenges as well as the path ahead. Next slide, please. Faculty engagement is part of the Impact 2025 uh, commitment to um, uh, sorry, commitment to community and belonging, uh, specifically the action items, measuring and addressing annual climate survey data and increasing job satisfaction. Uh, faculty engagement also plays a key role in supporting action items focused on recruiting and retaining diverse faculty. And I apologize, I'm getting an alert that my internet connection is, uh, is unstable. So please let me know if you are having a problem hearing me. Uh, next slide, please. Our employee engagement survey here at the university was developed in 2013 in partnership with an advisory group of University of Minnesota faculty and with input from our survey vendor, the global consulting firm Corn Ferry. The faculty version of the survey was designed to measure key aspects of the workplace and work experiences relevant for faculty. It was designed to be brief and easy to administer and to align with scientific research and leading practices in employee engagement. Those who take the faculty version of the survey include uh, tenure and tenure, tenured and tenure track faculty, those in non tenure track faculty roles, as well as lecturers and teaching specialists. The survey has been administered every other October for the past several years, uh, most recently in 2019. Leaders with five or more responses to the survey receive results in January following the survey. And due to very strong response rates that we've had from faculty and staff, uh, all colleges and the vast majority of our academic departments, divisions, and cooperatives received reports uh, from the 2019 survey. And uh, of course, the survey is just a survey. It's designed to uh, drive action. And so leaders at all levels have access to tools, uh, training, uh, and support of various forms to help them interpret their survey results, discuss the results with their colleagues, and then create and implement action plans to address issues and enhance engagement. Next slide, please. Employee engagement is the extent to which individuals devote time, energy, and effort at work. And the highest levels of engagement result from facing meaningful challenges while also having the support and resources needed to meet those challenges. The University of Minnesota survey measures engagement with two key metrics. First is commitment and dedication, which refers to commitment, motivation, and pride in the work and the university. Second is effective environment which refers to conditions that allow individuals to be effective in their roles, including receiving supports, uh, having resources, and the removal of barriers to getting work done efficiently. The survey also measures 10 engagement drivers, which can be acted on to create a higher level of engagement. Considerable research has linked employee engagement with a range of important outcomes for individuals and organizations. Ultimately, to boil it down, Enhancing employee engagement helps achieve and sustain a higher level of productivity and well being and increases retention by fostering better working relationships, resilience, and development. Next slide, please. Commitment and dedication is the first key metric, and it is measured by the four items you see here on this slide. Uh, just to orient you to what you're looking at, uh, next to each survey item, the green bar shows the percent of faculty who responded favorably on the 2019 survey. The gray bar shows the percent who responded neutrally, and the red bar shows the percent who responded unfavorably. Some guidelines or rules of thumb for interpreting these scores are that in general, 70% favorable or higher is usually a clearly favorable result, or you might call it a strong score. Neutral or unfavorable ratings of 20% or more typically represent an opportunity for improvement. The two columns on the right compare the percent favorable from 2019, the green bar, with the percent favorable in 2017 and 2015. A positive number indicates favorability increased over time and a negative number means it decreased over time. So as you can see on this slide, when looking at university-wide faculty responses, Commitment and dedication is strong at 73% favorable and has remained fairly stable between 2015 and 2019. I also wanna 
mention that uh, a recent study that was, uh, uh, that was posted by uh, the Gallup organization, and Gallup is one of the largest global consulting firms that does work in employee engagement, um, they looked at faculty engagement and the student experience, and they found evidence, and this really probably isn't a surprise, but they, they documented it in their data, that strong faculty engagement is linked uh, pretty strongly to a better student experience. So maintaining this high level of faculty engagement that you see on this slide is also going to be important in contributing to our commitment to student success. Next slide, please. Uh, the second uh, key metric on the survey is effective environment, uh, which reflects conditions that allow individuals to be successful in their roles. When looking at university-wide faculty responses, uh, effective environment is a bit lower than commitment and dedication uh, and has remained fairly consistent between 2015 and 2019. A majority of faculty, 65% in this case, report that they have an effective environment. However, if, if you look at the bottom two survey items listed here, you'll see that there are opportunities to address barriers to productivity and to getting work done efficiently. Next slide, please. As in any large organization, engagement, of course, varies at the local level. Looking at total organizational data gives you one view, uh, but a lot is going on uh, at the local level. Um, so for example, uh, when looking at individual colleges and campuses at the university, uh, faculty favorability on commitment and dedication, that one key metric, ranges from a low of 57% favorable to 88, a high of 88% favorable. Uh, when you look at effective environment, you also see quite a range. Uh, faculty favorability ranges from a low of 49% favorable to 82% favorable. Also, our survey vendor, Corn Ferry, provides a norm for each of these key metrics. Um, now, this is based on scores from a, across a range of organizations and industries. There is not a good benchmark for uh, the University of Minnesota in terms of our peers or organization or universities we would consider peers. Um, uh, we are kind of out in front in terms of measuring this at the total university level. Um, so, you know, taking this, this benchmark with a grain of salt is probably important. That being said, um, it is a norm that tells us what you see in large organizations around the world. And as you can see here, faculty commitment and dedication at the University of Minnesota exceeds this benchmark and is actually in the range you would see in high performing organizations, such as high performing Fortune 500 companies, for example. At the same time, uh, university faculty report slightly less effective environment uh, compared to this external norm, which reflects an opportunity for improvement. In terms of change over time, the data that we have shows that where action is taken to address feedback from the survey, faculty report improvements uh, in subsequent surveys, and they rate their work environment, confidence and leadership, and intention to stay at the university, among other things, more highly compared to faculty who say they did not see action taken on a previous survey. Next slide, please. Responses to the engagement survey also tell us the extent to which faculty feel valued and experience a sense of belonging at work, which are key indicators of campus climate. Uh, for the past several years, the College MADE initiative, and that stands for Multicultural Access, Diversity, and Equity, has provided individual colleges within the University of Minnesota with data-driven approaches to increase representational diversity, improve campus climate, and then create partnerships. Uh, as part of this initiative, um, engagement survey data, such as uh, uh, what I'm going to show you in a minute, just uh, an example of some of that, um, broken down by race and ethnicity, has been shared with each college leadership team to inform discussion and action aimed at improving the climate for faculty. Next slide, please. So I want to highlight uh, responses to two survey items uh, that are key indicators of climate. Uh, first is the item, overall, my department demonstrates a strong commitment to diversity and inclusion. Uh, this item was identified several years ago as an area of focus system-wide and responses to the 2019 survey from faculty suggest that uh, departments are taking more visible, uh, clearer action to support diversity and inclusion. As you can see, there have been increases in favorability on this item across all groups since the 2015 survey. I would note, however, that white faculty are the most likely to agree with this statement and Hispanic faculty are the least likely to agree. Next slide, please. A second key indicator of climate is the item, I have opportunities to achieve my personal career objectives at my campus. 
there have been increases in favorability on this item for all groups since 2015. However, similar to the previous item, Hispanic faculty were the least likely to agree with this statement. Next slide, please. Uh, taking a step back and looking at the university-wide faculty data, I want to highlight a few key takeaways. Now, there's lots of data, so there are a lot of takeaways, but just to highlight a few. Um, first is that engagement has increased since 2015 and remains high, even when you compare this to um, external benchmarks for high-performing organizations. Um, so commitment and dedication uh, is a real strength uh, for our, our faculty and our institution. Um, there are notable increases in faculty favorability on key climate items among BIPOC faculty. Um, at the same time, there was somewhat lower favorability on climate items among Hispanic faculty. Um, I would also note that uh, faculty and leadership roles play a very important role in supporting faculty engagement. We have incorporated employee engagement practices and tools into our University of Minnesota supervisory development program, which faculty uh, do take increasingly. Um, as well as into the academic department leadership program that uh, Vice Provost um, Ropers talked about earlier. Um, finally, uh, going beyond system-wide data, it is important to consider that the, the key is action uh, when it comes to engagement, where action is taken to address feedback from faculty, engagement tends to go up. Um, so Chair Davenport, uh, my colleague, Dr. Phil Bullman, will present the next section, uh, which will highlight how two colleges have taken action to enhance employee engagement. Thank you for that. Dr. Bowman. Thank you, Chair Devonport and members of the committee. So what I will do is give you two specific examples of how the survey results were used to improve the experiences of faculty and thereby advance the university. The first example is coming from the School of Nursing. As soon as the School of Nursing received results from the first system-wide employee engagement survey in 2013, its leadership began taking action on the feedback it received from staff and faculty. The goal was to find ways to further improve the work environment. Key to this initiative was sharing the data and engaging faculty and staff in discussions and find ways to make improvements together. The school convened a task force representing leadership and governance of the entire school. The task force continues to meet monthly. Its recommendations resulted in the formation of key working groups that focused on issues specific to staff and faculty, as well as school-wide initiatives. Key efforts have been in the areas of, of well-being and work-life integration, inclusion, diversity, and equity, professional development opportunities, recognition, respect and civility, and supervision and leadership. All clinical faculty had adjustments made to their workload allocations to specify time for scholarship and service. In addition, school leadership was providing training and resources to enhance onboarding and improve supervision. Senior leadership and, and key faculty members participated in leadership development to support all of these engagement efforts. The data demonstrate the effectiveness of all these actions taken. So during the five surveys that have been performed since 2013, uh, there is a steady upward trend for employee engagement for both faculty and staff. And I'm also glad to add that in 2020, the School of Nursing was recognized for these efforts with the National Sigma Healthy Work Environment Award, an honor awarded by the Sigma Global Nursing Excellence. Let me move on to the second example, which comes from the College of Food, Agricultural and Natural Resource Sciences. And I see that slide has already been shown. Thank you. As you can see from this slide, CFAN's faculty voiced in the engagement survey the desire for an enhanced effort in leadership development, uh, which clearly overlaps with agenda item number two of this committee today. The college has taken that call very seriously. To date, three faculty cohorts have participated in CFANS' leadership development program. The cohorts meet about half a day once per month, and they have projects uh, that they work on in between those sessions. Typically, there are about 10 sessions during the academic year. 
The target of stage one of CFAN's leadership development program is early to mid-career, so about halfway through the associate professor rank. Some members of the current cohort are, for example, director of graduate studies or director of undergraduate studies. Most recently, a subset of the original three cohorts has also been taking a more advanced stage two leadership training that is more intensive and focuses on real life cases wherever that is possible. And so it is the expectation from CFANS to draw in the future from this cohort for new department heads. CFANS is also relying on these cohorts for specific projects. So one example is a group that helped establish a CFANS Women in Science Lectureship Program. Uh, others include mentoring circles and other professional development activities. Finally, another cohort is working on a project to assess the college's organizational design and its effect on programmatic and service delivery. So, Conclusion, uh, the two praiseworthy examples that I've just uh, given you uh, share a couple of features. They empower a broader group of faculty and staff to contribute, and they both emphasize leadership development. And so considering these, uh, uh, or his remarks just a couple of minutes ago, I believe Regent McMillan should be pleased about that. With that, uh, Chair Devonport, I give it back to you. Thank you. Good, good presentation. Great examples. Uh, Dr. Croson, are you continuing next? I think we are opening it up for comments and questions at this stage. Oh, okay. thank you. There we go. Perfect. So again, uh, we're especially interested in your feedback, of course, about these uh, examples, but also about other organizations you might have seen uh, that have taken actions to enhance employee engagement and other strategies that you might suggest from your own experiences or those of others. Very good, thank you again. And I will look for hands. Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Davenport and uh, Professor Billman, you're absolutely right. I was uh, pleased to see that and hear that. And uh, I'm uh, quite, thrilled that uh, these three pieces of uh, you know what you've chosen for this committee to bring to the board do hang together around this theme and that obviously isn't accidental. So uh, another question and I was thinking about this one last time but see if I can be less wordy this time. Um, how much how much effort is there to to I'm going to use the phrase shoulder tap when you see talent in the fact faculty ranks that strikes you as that person, my good leader. And how much, so there's shoulder tapping on the one hand where someone says that's, you know, Professor Z is gonna be really, really a good leader. We gotta go work on Professor Z versus self-select where Professor Y says, I think I got what it takes and I wanna get into this. Is, is it a balance of both? I mean, this is, kind of subtle stuff and maybe there isn't, I'm not looking for an objective answer, just a little more uh, input perhaps and perspective on whether you pursue one over the other. Again, one end being total self-identification of leadership interest and the other being what I call the shoulder tap, you know, either aggressive or unaggressive style. And I don't know who that's best for, but uh, Professor Billman, some of what you were getting at and uh, the two prior presenters' presentations as well got there. So any feedback for me on that question or that idea? Good question. Uh, who would like to take that? Provost Croson. I'll, I'll go ahead. Thank you, Chair Davenport. Thank you, Regent McMillan. So I think the short answer is yes and both and and. Um, there's, uh, I, I mentioned in, in one of my answers to Regent Powell previously this the shift around mentorship and sponsorship. And a big part of sponsorship is identifying opportunities for people to take on leadership roles that are not you know, becoming department chair, but more dipping your toe in the water and saying, so is this the kind of thing that you'd like and that you would wanna pursue? Uh, and what we find when we tap people for those, and, and as I mentioned, some of those are through um, faculty governance, there's also other kind of leadership roles 
within the department. So you can be the director for undergraduate studies or the director for graduate studies, even if you're not ready for a department chair type position. Uh, and what we find is that some people who are tapped really love it. And some people who are tapped decide that they would really rather spend the rest of their career as faculty members. And, and that's right. an excellent, those are both excellent outcomes. Let's just say that. Mm -hmm. So it's really the confluence of, of, you know, people do raise their hands. We also tap people, but not everybody who gets tapped, you know, takes to it. Thank you. Any follow-up, anyone else? Uh, yeah, Regent Davenport, maybe a quick follow-up. Please. Does the, uh, does the, uh, Industry offer, uh, we, we offer opportunities for leadership within, you know, within the industry, for instance, you know, at, at going to conferences and engaging with peers and cross university activities. You know, we used to look for internal projects for people to lead if we didn't have an org chart spot for them to lead. And uh, in the utility industry, I doubt there's anything comparable, but but there were things that uh, you could get someone engaged in with their peers, you know, in transmission engineering, and they might, you know, learn something they didn't know about themselves in that. So I assume we cover that whole spectrum of opportunities. Uh, Provost Croson. Yes, thank you, uh, Reed Millen. Indeed, we do. Um, I was, you know, one of the topics that was mentioned was the Big Ten Academic Alliance, which is part of that. Yeah. Um, but we also find that faculty engage in leadership opportunities in their own discipline, right? Maybe they'll be the, the president or some leadership role in their professional society, they'll organize a conference, and that's often the pathway for them to decide that they, that they like academic leadership. Great, thank you. True, true. Ed Davenport, I, ha I have a comment if I may. Please, yes. Thank you. Dr. Um, Sullivan. Yeah, to, to, the, to the question of sort of tapping uh, faculty uh, for being uh, for leadership roles, one thing that um, I've definitely seen and, and, and many of us who have been working um, with sort of emerging faculty leaders uh, at the college level have seen is that, um, you know, obviously faculty aren't in their current roles if they're not leaders yet to be leaders as much as, as in their discipline, right, to be experts, to be scholars, to teach. Um, you know, some, some do aspire to leadership, but that's not typically, you know, what, what people go into their discipline for. Um, and so when it comes time to consider who, you know, who is our leadership bench for our, say, department chair roles, department head roles, those kinds of things. Um, you know, one of the things that I've seen is that some uh, faculty who would make amazing leaders have never thought about it. They don't know really what that involves. They have some sense that it maybe wouldn't be helpful for their career or that they wouldn't be good at it or have different conceptions of what it is. And so that's where some of the leadership development is actually helpful in, help, in, in sort of discerning, is a leadership role right for me? Um, and if I do go into a leadership role, how does it help me career-wise? What might be some of the barriers I would face given my own skills, knowledge, and abilities? You know, is this going to be a good fit for me or not? And, and, and how might I get support for, for that if I decide to go that direction? So especially as we think about, um, you know, encouraging and supporting um, uh, diversity within our leadership ranks, um, that's an important thing for us to be thinking about in our leadership programs. And we are is, you know, how do we, you know, identify um, faculty who maybe would not normally be tapped or in the past wouldn't be tapped or might not think of themselves as leaders who would be amazing leaders and then support them in that. So I just wanted to share that perspective. Thanks. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Regent Powell. Okay, just uh, Chair Davenport, just a quick comment. You know, I, I think this is um, really excellent work. And I, you know, I, I congratulate the team, first of all, for having, you know, for being such a leader in this and having started so long ago. And, and uh, it's, 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 it's really impressive. And so just a few comments, uh, you know, first of all, the, uh, on the environment um, uh, point that was made that, um, that those scores are weaker and the, you know, the productivity, you know, metric is, is quite weak. And I, you know, I guess I would offer the observation that, you know, in large organizations, that is often the case. And when you, you know, look at the narrative comments that your respondents have made on that one, it's you know, they typically they're going to say we're too big, we're too slow, too many people involved in decisions, we get in our own way. 
And, you know, I would guess that, you know, a very, very large research institution, we'd hear the same things. And but we should we should try to we should go after that one because it's, um, you know, I mean, we're, we're seeing it in the numbers. And then the other the other area I like to uh, you know really offer a compliment is just going after these things. And, and uh, you know, with the examples, I think are really powerful and you don't have to do a lot. You have to pick one or two big things and make them visible and work them. And you're doing that. And um, I, again, I, I think it's really impressive. I'm impressive that you're gathering this data and I think you're using it really well. So um, kudos as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, Regent Powell. I'll add to that it, in case you missed it, um, I think one element of engagement is uh, noted by who participates in these kind of um, surveys and the participation rate of faculty and staff is over 72%, which was the board goal um, set. Um, I'm not exactly sure when that was set, but it was set and we've exceeded it um, two years ahead of schedule. So I think um, just even that, that one little marker demonstrates um, our faculty and staff's interest in where they work and their engagement. Uh, I don't see any other hands up. So thank, thank you, These, um, this combination of um, uh, presentations, I think, work together. And as we look at next year's plan, um, as is whatever the committee is, um, a question will be if we should stick with these themes. So at some point, you might want to give input on if you thought that was a good way to go or not. Uh, we have a few more agenda items, but let's take a, uh, what about a five minute break? Um, if you need it, we'll be back in five minutes, which According to my clock would be, I'm at 3.47, so 3.52. See you in a few minutes.
Madam Chair, you may proceed. Thank you. The Mission Fulfillment Committee will please come back to order. Our next agenda item is uh, student education records. And these are, we're looking at proposed amendments uh, to student education records. And this is part of a regu regular comprehensive review. Um, a policy is part of our regular review process. And um, this one is, um, going to be walked through for us um, by Dr. Uh, Stacy Tidball, Director of Continuity and Compliance in Academic Support Resource Resources. Get that right. Um, but uh, before I turn it over to Director Tidball, uh, do you have some opening comments, Provost Croson? Thank you, Chair Davenport and members of the committee. We seek your review of proposed amendments to the Board of Regents policy on student education records with a vote scheduled for our next meeting. The proposed amendments stem from a comprehensive review of the policy and extensive consultation with the university community. These edits also are responsive to advocacy for increased privacy protections from MSA and other student organizations. The amendments maintain the university's obligations to the Federal Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, FERPA, and the Minnesota Government Data Practices Act, DPA. Stacy Tidball is here to explain the proposal further. Ms. Tidball is Director of Continuity and Compliance in Academic Support Resources and the university's Student Data Privacy Officer. Ms. Tidball holds a law degree from the University of Minnesota and has been with ASR since 2014. Chair Davenport, with your permission, I'd like to ask Stacy to begin. Yes, thank you. Director Tidball. Yes, thank you, Chair Davenport, members of the committee and Provost Corson. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so as has been briefly mentioned, this policy uh, is before you as part of comprehensive review. It was last revised in 2011. And the edits recommended as part of this process are uh, what was developed as part of consultation and then with student advocacy as well. Next slide, please. Since the policy was last revised in 2011, several things have changed in the information privacy landscape. Most notably, student awareness and advocacy on information privacy has increased. In fact, there's been direct advocacy to change this policy uh, by student representatives to the Board of Regents, and then in a corresponding Minnesota Student Association resolution from December 2018. Following that resolution, uh, the MSA did extensive consultation through the year of 2019, which was then ultimately merged with this comprehensive review effort. Other changes include uh, that the university receives substantially more requests for our public data today than it did when this policy was last revised in 2011. And I'll go slightly more into detail on the interplay of that later. Additionally, privacy is a more regulated space. The proposed edits uh, move us toward the trends in new privacy regulations, such as the GDPR or the California Privacy Rights Act. It's also important to know that we live in a, in a world of increasing information security risks, such as phishing scams. Using data that is publicly available, scammers can target students. So it's with this landscape that we are here today. Next slide, please. First, I want to briefly explain how our policy works today. The vast majority of the university's student information is private under FERPA. And our, and our policy provides some basic information about students is public, commonly called directory information. The directory information on students we have today can be broken down into two categories. First, students' relationship to the university, things such as which campus they're affiliated with, their college and degree program. And then secondly, students' contact information, their physical addresses, phone numbers, and their university email address. Students can make that directory information private using a process known as suppression, but otherwise their directory information remains public and must be disclosed upon request under the Minnesota Government Data Practices Act. Next slide, please. 
So in response to that changing landscape I discussed on slide three, we are proposing uh, some changes to the public and directory information category. In 2011, federal regulations were revised, allowing institutions to adopt what's called a limited directory policy. Limited directory places some information in a sphere that, while not publicly accessible, works like publicly accessible information within the university community. The proposed edits here move student contact information, their physical addresses, telephone numbers, and university email into that new limited directory category. By removing it from fully public information, we can better protect our students' information and reduce the security risks mentioned. It will also help address a common complaint from our students that they are spammed at their university email address. The emails they receive today, in addition to important university business that we want them to pay attention to, uh, it can be cluttered with coupons from neighboring businesses, advertisements of local housing developments, uh, but worse, scammers advertising illegitimate job opportunities or even tax scams and phishing attempts. Next slide, please. The other changes to directory information proposed in the policy are less substantial. Uh, there are two pieces of data that we propose making part of either directory or limited directory information. We would like to add student employment information to the directory information category to make job titles, appointing department, the dates of employment, and percent time worked publicly available. This will support several business processes, including verifying employment for prospective employers of our students, and it will treat students' HR data very similar to, if not identical, to how we treat our other employee data. Secondly, we would like to add the UCARD photo to the limited directory category. Historically, this has been private student data, but this would move would, move, would make it easier to share these photos within the institution. Uses for these photos today include identification of students for services such as at the One Stop Student Services Office, sharing photos in our advising system, and also class rosters with photos. Finally, there are a few minor terminology changes in the directory information provision of section three, subdivision one of the policy. No intentional change, no, there's no intention to change the meaning here, sorry, uh, but rather clarify existing terms. So for example, we've replaced the word major with academic program to better reflect our full student body, including our graduate and professional students. Next slide, please. Finally, there are three other proposed policy edits. Uh, the student education records policy has not previously defined student or in attendance, which has caused some confusion in the past about whose records are subject to FERPA and our policy and when directory information may first be disclosed. The proposed definition for student uh, and in attendance will help clarify this. Uh, and that someone who has never attended our institution as a student, but perhaps taken only uh, a professional development opportunity or conference here is not subject to FERPA. And it also clarifies consistent with FERPA, the exact point in time a newly admitted student's information becomes subject to this policy. We're adding a definition of student group. Uh, it's consistent with the definition of student group used in the student conduct code, and it ensures our student groups across the system will be able to use limited directory information to conduct their outreach and promote events. Finally, there are a few edits recommended to section four, subdivision three of the policy regarding access to private student education records to better align with statutory language and Department of Education guidance. The main edit is to clarify when the university is required to versus permitted to share private student education records. The university must share uh, the records with the student that is the subject of the records. And so therefore this has been separated into its own sentence. Thank you, that is the end of my overview of the policy and I'm happy to hear any questions you may have. Thank you, Director Tidball. I recognize that um, working between FERPA, Minnesota Data Privacy and student interest in student information is a huge task. So uh, thank you for that. And um, I see that we have Regent Farnsworth up with questions. Regent Farnsworth, would you like to go ahead, please? Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Davenport. And just a few 
um, quick things. One, I really appreciate the work on this. I'm acutely aware that it's been a um, concern for a while now um, from students and it's great to see, you know, and be able to draw a really bold line between um, feedback that we've got from student representatives to the board and uh, student governance associations, you know, right to an outcome. Um, sometimes it's, sometimes paths are more complicated than others within the shared governance and apparatus, but I think it's important to um, shout that out um, and recognize that um, when we have a really awesome example um, of um, shared governance at work here. So I'm really excited about that. Um, two brief or one question and then one um, hypothetical I want to put out there just to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. Um, with the student employee data part, um, you know, which we're going to be basically aligning on what uh, student employee data will be available, you know, similar to other employee data. I'm just curious, um, what if any feedback we got on that part um, from um, consultation that were was done with students. Um, and then as part of that, um, are we, and I'm assuming we are, but just to, you know, confirm, um, making sure um, for kind of all student employee onboarding or training or whatnot that this um, new change will be will be a part of that um, going forward. You know, once once approved. Director Tidball. Thank you, Chair Davenport and Regent Farnsworth and members of the committee. Thank you for that feedback. I, I greatly appreciate that. And this is the culmination of lots of consultation across the university and a, and a great deal of time as well. So it's, it's exciting to be here. Uh, regarding the employee data, so again, um, items like a student employee's title uh, and their dates of employment, uh, we didn't receive specific feedback uh, from students on this particular item. Honestly, I suspect that that's a reflection of the fact that people commonly treat this as public in their own lives. Typically, students are promoting this information using tools like LinkedIn, uh, using their own resume, and by applying for jobs. So uh, what ends up happening is students are, are promoting that information and then asking the university to, to confirm that information on their behalf, and that's the most common scenario here. I do think your point is well taken that we need to make sure student employees understand how their data works and don't make assumptions that it will be private just because other student information is. And we do plan to do uh, extensive communication and education to ensure that any of the changes that end up being uh, that end up moving forward that people understand their obligations. Thank you, Thank you director. And any further? Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, one quick um, other uh, question, just to make sure I'm understanding um, one specific part of this correctly. So um, hypothetical scenario, which I guess isn't really um, hypothetical, but just wanna uh, make sure. So, you know, one, um, you know, common email um, that comes to mind, for instance, is like when um, the, something called the student section reaches out and everyone gets all, you know, a lot of students get, um, get concerned about, you know, how did their, how did X company um, get their um, email? So if, if um, X company reaches out to the university um, requesting to do a promotional um, or offer a promotional item or outreach to students, um, what does that process look like? And what information do they get access to? And I just wanted to highlight that piece of it one more time, just to make sure I'm um, for, either folks that are watching or have questions about this and for my own information as well, um, just to understand exactly what that process looks like. Okay, thank you. Uh, Regent Powell. Uh, I think Stacy Stacy might need to answer the last question if that's oh, all right. Okay. Yes, thank, thank you, Chair Davenport. Uh, so um, regarding your question, uh, how it works today, if uh, say a local business, a local perhaps restaurant or something of the like wants to market to our students, uh, they would be directed to reach out through um, our data request center or our data request portal and make a request for student information. That, that request is then vetted uh, through the data request center and we would provide only public information in response to such a request. But they could then receive uh, and would receive a list of all of our students' uh, email addresses and physical 
email addresses, for example, if that's what they wanted, that have not been suppressed by individual students. So they could very easily obtain a list of thousands of thousands of student emails and then use that to, to market, whether it's their discounts or their local business and the like. That is the most common pathway by which uh, students are receiving those kinds of messages today, either because they've received those lists in the past or they've made a, a more current request for student information. The, the changes proposed here would absolutely change that dynamic because by moving them into limited directory, we'd be circulating those emails um, for requests, but only within our university community. The, the, local, the local restaurant or sandwich shop, they would no longer have access to an email list such as that. Thank you. Thank you, Director Tidball. Now, Regent Powell. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And I, I, I want to make sure I'm understanding this, and I may be, I may be confused. Um, Director Tid, uh, Tidball is the, um, just thinking about your last answer, is the default position that the data would be, is limited and private, or is, or is the default that it's, it's in the, that larger, more open pool? Director Tidball, well, go ahead. Uh, sorry. Well, why don't you? Because the the reason that I'm asking is because, um, you know, given the risks around data these days that, that you correctly noted, I mean, scams and phishing, and you know, more you know, extreme and and dangerous examples of criminality. Um, you know, I really do worry about this, and it it, it seems to me that that the our position ought to be that um, the student data is private uh, unless they choose to disclose it. And instead, I mean, I think we have it, you know, I think we have it the wrong way around. We have it as more open unless they choose not to. And I, 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 don't, know, I don't know why we would do it that way. I, I do think that there are a lot of risks around, you know, giving too um, uh, free access to this data. And I, I would make it as private as we could. Student wants to disclose it, they can do that. But um, I, I think we've got it the wrong way around. I mean, and that is the thought behind the question. Thank you, uh, Regent Powell. And it might be helpful as you answer this to put up the slide that is, um, I have it as number 82. Thank you, Chair Davenport. Uh, and Regent Powell. So uh, I'll try not to overcomplicate the answer, but of course my, my lawyerly background and the actual state of affairs might get slightly in the way here. But uh, in terms of what information defaults in what way, uh, the vast majority of our information is private information. Um, and under these revisions, what would default to fully public are those things that I described as the directory information about a student's relationship to the institution. So um, what would default as completely public would be a student's uh, campus, their college, their degree program, any degrees earned, uh, their advisor uh, dates of enrollment. So again, that, those things that describe their relationship as a student to the university. Then in sort of a next tier down, there are some items that would default into that limited directory category that's used within the university community. And that would be the student's contact information. So it would be their addresses, their telephone numbers, and their university email. So if you want to think about um, sort of the overall overall framework here, it's a slight pulling back of their contact information into a more private space. Uh, from an information privacy perspective, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with your comments that there, there's risk in having information publicly available. And that's one of the primary reasons to, to pull back this contact information slightly is it decreases students' risk and their susceptibility to phishing scams, tax scams. Uh, it decreases institutional risk as well because um, there is 
you know, there are certainly scammers, hackers, et cetera, that are wanting to use the public information we put out there to gain control of student accounts and then use that in a cascading way to perhaps gain access to systems in more serious ways. And we absolutely want to, to make that as difficult as possible and protect our students' information. And we want to place control in the hands of our students where we can to disclose their own information and to exercise, exercise control over that. All of that being said, we're trying to walk a, a balance here of also recognizing that um, you know, there's an expectation that uh, we're gonna be able to verify someone's degree, for example, uh, and make it clear that whether someone graduated from here or didn't, uh, and many other business processes that rely on that. That's just uh, one example. The other thing that I think is worth noting here is that FERPA is somewhat, uh, although it's a privacy, obligation and privacy statute, in some ways its structure is a little bit of a barrier here to defaulting everything as private. Um, mm -hmm. Because what FERPA does is say everything's private except for the stuff that an institution designates as directory or limited directory. And then from there, students can, can suppress it, make it private. The other option we have is to make nothing directory uh, and rely only on student consent uh, in order to dole out student information where needed. We could go that route. It would be pretty dramatically different than our peers. It's also somewhat administratively burdensome if for each student you have a very unique set of information that you dole out in that way. Does that answer your question or questions? It, it it does. That it does. That's helpful. And you know, this is sort of a evolving situation. We'll see how it goes. But you know, we may well get to the point where we really where we decide that everything will be private unless the student decides you know, to disclose it. But I understand that you know today uh, is not that day. But um, it, it, this is will be a continuing concern for me. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, um, thank you for that explanation as related to FERPA. And also, um, you may, others may or may not know that the Minnesota Data Privacy Act is one of the strictest in the country as well, I think. Uh, Regent Rosha, you're up next, then Regent Kenyanya. Thank you, Chair Davenport. And I, I think <clears throat> Regent Powell raises very important uh, questions, and uh, this has been a long, long process. Um, in, in trying to find that balance between the protection and, and, and yet the engagement, I think, of students as they enter this. And that, that kind of leads to my question. Um, and if this was covered I, already and, and I just didn't catch it, I, I apologize. But under the definition of student, um, it, it talks about a student that is registered and attended um, any class. Um, and, and this is especially, I think, relevant in the subdivision seven portion of related to student groups and then the next section down, that would seem to me that we don't consider a student until the first day of classes, which then would seem to follow that their information would not be available to any student group or others before the first day of classes. Am I, am I reading that right? Um, and, and this is especially, I, I know it's come up in the past uh, with groups that that have traditionally had housing options available with them, where they will they would you know communicate with incoming uh, first year students um, and uh, you know for, for recruitment for membership and so on. Is that does this indicate a uh, an end to that process? That at that at this point, those student organizations would only be able to to pursue students after they've already enrolled in you know in in, in a class and, and attended the class. Director Tidball. Thank you, Chair Davenport and Regent Rosha. So uh, I, I would agree with that overall reading that what we're doing is the information that is made available on the basis of being directory or limited directory, if that's the basis on which we're making information available, that would start for new students when they first become enrolled with us. That doesn't start over each academic year. So it's especially pertinent that timing for our new entering freshmen and our new entering transfer students or our new entering first year students. That being said, uh, that's not the only way that a student group might be reaching out to a new student. So, uh, you know, one of the examples that you mentioned would be uh, organizations that perhaps have a housing connection to our students and want to uh, 
advertise that opportunity, if you will. Um, first of all, there are very few of those that pertain to our new freshmen. Um, there's, you know, at our undergraduate population, there really is a drive to have them in university housing for a variety of reasons, particularly student success. Um, However, there are multiple ways to reach students, uh, and one of those is sort of a pass-through process by which you're working with a, a staff person at the university who's communicating on your behalf to students. And if it's your job as a staff person to reach out to students, you have that information, not just on the basis of it being limited or directory information, you'd have that information available to you as a school official with a, a job need, a business need for that information. So uh, if it were, um, say, an affinity group of student group, um, or perhaps something like a Greek like life organization, they could work through staff uh, in relevant offices, such as the Office of Fraternity and Sorority Life, to pass a message on to students uh, on, on behalf of those organizations uh, and or even ask students permission, would you like to receive information from these organizations prior to this date? And if we had student consent, we could absolutely share the information in those cases. Did you Rosha, follow up? Yeah, thank you. Well, and, and I guess the, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm just, wondering if there's been a dialogue with those organizations because I know for many, many you know generations of students there have been um, recruitment and other um, kind of events prior to the, the, the start of classes uh, where they've introduced those students to their organizations and um, this is a, you know this is a pretty dramatic change and, and I'm just my question is is have they been part of this dialogue and they know this is the change and they're comfortable with what you just described as the new way of of having access uh, to students, um, because you know, if, if not, then I would, you know, I would ask the question, uh, you know, should they be? And and then also, um, what is the the impact of when a when an entering student does first enroll, um, you know, having that that be the definition, which is the old definition of, of when someone becomes a student, um, you know, as opposed to this change where. There's that, it's a fairly narrow group of people, I think, that are being affected. It's those, you know, the, primarily the incoming class, and I suppose some people coming in from, from outside. But um, I, I just want to make sure that this is, that, that this isn't a function of surprise, um, that this is actually something we've been talking about. And we've made, and we as, a, as an institution, as a board, make a very conscious decision that that's no longer going to be part of the enterprise. And this is why it's no longer part. This is what we're trying to protect against. And this is what, you know, um, uh, we gain by this as a, you know, in, when we haven't heard the other side saying, well, this is the advantage that we have of, of maintaining the, the process as, as it had been before. So, uh, Director Tidball, the question of consultation with these student groups, and then uh, we'll go to Regent Kenyanya. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Davenport and Regent Rosha. Yes, that's a great consultation uh, question, and the consultation was extensive. Uh, Part of it was done through uh, the Minnesota Student Association, and I've done a, a good deal of it as well, but uh, I can assure you that uh, the Office of Fraternity and Sorority Life and Student Affairs were consulted from the university staff perspective of this. Uh, there were also conversations with the Greek Life and Fraternity Council, uh, as well as other student groups that are, are not in that particular sphere. Um, as well as uh, discussing this at, at a forum for the Minnesota Student Association to catch leaders of other student groups as well. So uh, there, there was consultation and understanding of that. I think it's wise again to, to refresh that understanding should this move forward uh, to make sure everyone is aware and, and how they can work through their, their needs for information going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. And just a reminder too that um, it's reviewed today and back in June for a vote. Uh, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, Director Tidball uh, for the presentation. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I wanna, I guess first just offer a, a general endorsement um, for the direction that we're headed um, with the policy. It certainly as a student did surprise me that it was more of an opt out, you know, rather than an opt in of your, of your information um, being shared. So. Um, I like the conversation we've been having. I think there's a lot of good material um, comments and questions that have been asked, but you know, I, I agree very much with Regent Powell 
um, and, and really that it we should suppress to to the uh, fullest extent allowed by law rather than you know um, kind of kind of the opposite for for a lot of the the reasons brought up and and stated there a um, couple just quick questions one was um, how and I tried to read through it um, in the in the language but just for absolute clarity um, how does um, when someone is no longer alumni you know someone's no longer a student um, whether well whether because they're just not a student or, or they did graduate and become an alumni um, does does anything change there um, or 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 is the data treated the same um, and I, I you know because enrollment status um, name you know we all understand why that's shared especially for employment verification and things like that um, but we do have I mean, under addresses, that could be your home address that isn't on campus and whatnot and things of that nature. So how, how does this relate to folks who are no longer um, students? And then I know you, you mentioned a couple of times consulting with Minnesota Student Association, um, which is appropriate because I do think they were one of the main groups, um, you know, who brought up the concern, but um, was curious if that consultation has um, extended across the system as well. Director Tidwell. Thank you, Chair Davenport and Regent Kenyano. I appreciate that feedback, that, that's wonderful. Uh, regarding alumni, uh, it's a little bit complex, but I think at the very basic explanation is that uh, the status of the, um, you know, their public information and then whether they had suppressed any of it, that remains in place uh, as they left it when they graduated. And if they want to contact us to adjust that privacy setting, we will work with alumni on their behalf. Um, that being said, for Alumni, uh, the main interest in alumni data and requests that we get relate to being able to confirm what they did here at the university yeah. in terms of their degree programs, degrees earned, dates of enrollment, verifying essentially for you know a situation like graduate education or an employer that that what they're you know saying is in fact matching our university records. There's really not an interest in you know requests for alumni address and phone information because it's simply no longer current. I think there's a common understanding that people, that's a phase in people's life where they tend to, to move. Also, um, we're tracking alumni information differently, uh, you know, for, for reasons of alumni engagement, uh, and that's tracked separately in alumni records, separate from their student records controlled by this policy. And then I believe you had a second part to your con. Oh, it was about consultation with the system student associations. Is that correct? Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, just system bodies in general. Yes. Including student associations. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for that prompt. Uh, so specifically, um, the Minnesota Student Association reached out to the student governance bodies on the other campus as well. Um, I believe it was Duluth Student Association that made a specific statement in support, but in general, uh, the, that consultation with students extended through that student governance process and the connection there. And then from, from the staff perspective, yes, there was extensive consultation uh, with uh, throughout our institution as well. So um, particularly each registrar on each campus works in this space pretty closely uh, and they were our lead consultants for, for those campuses. So there was a strong partnership there. All right. Madam Chair, some quick closing comment here. Regent Kenyanya. Thank you. Um, th thank you for the, for the answers and the, um, and the conversation, obviously. I, I, I just, I, I was thinking and just wanted to point out, you know, we. You mentioned about um, the format where data that is private, for example, I think the conversation with Regent Rosha about Greek life perhaps uh, would be funneled through a university staff member, you know, that has access to that as a university official. And, and you know, that's kind of seemed to make sense for me. But, you know, as I was thinking about it, I, I know in the past, you know, we talk about administration um, and, and the cost of it, the growing cost of it, and how we can create it ourselves. You know, and uh, it's just very interesting that, um, you know, certain things we do do contribute to, you know, to the to the growing because that's added resources, added costs um, of all that. So I just wanted to throw that in there. And then uh, a final <laughs> closing comment. Um, 
I, when I was a student, I did suppress my, um, my information. And that is why it wasn't in the local paper that I was on the uh, dean's list back here at home. So, <laughs> you know, there, there, there are a couple situations where you'd want your information out there. But anyway, thank you. We'll recognize that uh, after the fact there, Ujit Kenyanya. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, again, uh, this will come back in June for a vote. So uh, thank you, Director Tidball. Um, that's a big task, I know, and um, you um, buried it well. Thank All you right. for your time. And so now we're up to our consent report. And Provost Croson, will you please provide a brief introduction of the items in the consent report? And um, let me know if you have any questions through the hand raised colleagues. Thank you, Chair Davenport. Uh, there are two items for your approval in this month's consent report. The first is the request for approval of new or changed program. The list of new programs on the Twin Cities campus includes an MBA degree in management science and a post-baccalaureate certificate in entrepreneurship and innovation from the Carlson School, a first of its kind post-baccalaureate certificate in poultry health, which is jointly offered between the College of Veterinary Medicine and the College of Food, Agriculture and Natural Resource Science. In addition, new degree offerings on the Duluth and Crookston campuses include an undergraduate certificate in creative writing in the College of Liberal Arts on the Duluth campus, and a Bachelor of Science degree in applied agricultural communication, as well as three new undergraduate minors in graphic design, leadership, and programming on the Crookston campus. The second item in the consent report seeks approval for three faculty appointments with tenure, those appointments are for Peter Kang, a professor with tenure in the Department of Neurology in the Medical School, Jenna Marquardt, a professor with tenure in the School of Nursing, and Kate Peterson, an associate professor with tenure in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics in the Swenson College of Science and Engineering at the University of Minnesota Duluth. I propose these uh, alterations for your approval in the consent report. Thank you, Provost Croson. Is there a motion to approve the consent report? I'll move it. Moved and seconded. Second. Um, thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any questions or comments? Seeing none, Ms. Fountain, will you call the roll? On the motion to recommend approval of the committee consent report, Regent Farnsworth. Yes. Regent Farnsworth votes yes. Regent Herr is absent. Regent Hipsch. Yes. Regent Hipsch votes yes. Regent Johnson. Yes. Regent Johnson votes yes. Regent Kenyanya. Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Mayron. Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent McMillan. Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Powell. Yes. Regent Powell votes yes. Regent Rosha. Yes. Regent Rosha votes yes. Regent Swiggum. Yes. Regent Swiggum votes yes. Regent Verhalen. Yes. Regent Verhalen votes yes. Chair Davenport. Yes. Chair Davenport votes yes. Madam Chair, there are 11 in favor, none opposed, and one absent. By vote, a unanimous vote, the consent report is approved. Thank you. Uh, last item is the um, information items. And again, Provost Croson, would you please offer us some comments on this item? Thank you, Chair Davenport and members of the committee. There are two reports among your May information items. First, I'm pleased to share with you our regular report of select student, faculty, and staff accomplishments and activities. I will highlight just a few among the many items. The university has received a $14 million award from the National Institute on Aging to study how early life conditions and experiences 
shape later life risk of Alzheimer's and other dimensions. The university will add a second indigenous language house called the Dakota Language House next fall to advance and support students learning of the Dakota language. The Morris campus was awarded a US Department of Education five year $1.5 million grant to support Native American student success. The School of Nursing, together with the Bakken Center for Spirituality and Healing, received $6 million in awards in 2020, which places us 12th in NIH funding to schools of nursing, sixth among public universities, and first in the Big Ten. Professor Megan Gunner in the Institute of Child Development received a 2021 American Psychological Association Award for Distinguished Scientific Contribution in recognition of her contributions to basic research in psychology. And finally, Gudurun Jandal, a junior sociology and political science major on the College of Liberal Arts in the Twin Cities campus, has won one of the country's 62 prestigious Truman scholarships. We are very proud of all of the accomplishments of these faculty and students and all of those listed in your docket. The second report in your May information items is the 2021 biennial report on MinDrive to the Minnesota legislature. The report is prepared and submitted to the legislature biannually. It includes key metrics and results of the MinDrive program. It's a very impressive report and I hope you'll take a look at it if you haven't done already. This concludes my remarks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Provost Kroos. And I want to echo that I hope you've taken time to review the MinDrive report. Um, and if you haven't looked at it, please do. Uh, it reflects the first five years of MinDrive. And uh, I want to thank and hope you, when you see them, thank our legislature for um, what I think is wise funding in support of uh, really encompassing the strengths of the university, for example, in neuroscience and brain conditions, robotics, sensors, environment, uh, cancer, clinical trials, and that. Um, and also it um, provides um, resources to make those connections, what we talk about all the time in promoting um, and really recognizing our connection with the state of Minnesota as a whole and what the university contributes to the state and it, it's really exemplified there, whether it's societal impacts or um, seeking new collaborations um, in there, it features uh, plastic waste and how we can help remedy that. And also we talked a bit uh, this morning about um, taking risks. I think uh, when you look at the report, you'll see that um, we do take risks and often with very successful outcomes. Uh, look at the um, partnerships that are uh, exemplified in there, for example, the STEM Alliance, North Star STEM Alliance. So anyway, uh, I hope you take a look. It's, it's a really successful program. I think we need to um, highlight it, um, especially as we look at what does it mean for the future with the intersections goals. Um, in uh, President Gable's strategic plan. So uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity and um, I just uh, really want you to take a look at it. So please do that. Uh, there's no other um, business and I see no hands. So thank you for a great meeting, everyone. Presenters, thank you for the great presentations and we stand adjourned.